Okay, so uh, my name is Aliyah Miranda. Um, we're doing this uh, oral history interview for the Healthcare Disparities um, in COVID-19 project. Um, I'm conducting this interview with Isabella Oliver. Um, it's um, April 16th, 2020. Um, and we are conducting this interview with Miss Billy Avery. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this interview, Miss Avery. Um, could you do us a favor and spell out your full name? Um, Billy, B Y L L Y E, Avery, A V E R Y. Excellent. Um, Miss Avery, can you tell us um, where and when you were born? Uh, October 20th, 1937, in Waynesville, Georgia. Awesome. Um, Ms. Avery, can you start off by talking a little bit about your journey into studying um, or, or into the healthcare profession um, as an activist and what specific issues um, you seek to address in your work? Sure. Um, actually, my whole journey started in Gainesville, Florida. Um, right over in Cora Village. Um, um, uh, I was living in Jacksonville, Florida, and I um, got a fellowship to from the state of Florida to go to the University of Florida to um, study special education. And so this was 1960. Um, Fifty nine, sixty eight, sixty nine, and so I enrolled in the University of Florida and School of Education over in Norman Hall, and I, um, while I was there, my husband, I left my husband and two children in Jacksonville, and they were like ages um three and seven or something like that. And uh, my husband, Wesley, stayed and took care of him that year while I was down at University of Florida. And so he wanted to go back to school, too, um, to get his master's. And so he told me, when you go down there, find out how white people can go to college, have children, and, um, and go to school. Because we were having a hard time making it working and having children. And we couldn't imagine going to school. And so when I got there, I found out how. And so he got a fellowship. And um, the following year, we moved into um, Cory Village, um, 280-2, Cory Village with our kids. <laughs> and, and, um, and all. it was really, I didn't know it then, but it was the beginning of the changing of my whole life trajectory, or, or maybe I should say a forming of it. Um, sadly, we were there for about two years. Um, Wesley did get a fellowship um, at UFL in, um, in the School of um, in Education. And he, um, on 1970, November, he had a massive heart attack and died um, while we were there. And um, it was just, um, I mean, I still have his wallet that had the Gator football tickets that we were to go to the game on that Saturday and everything. And that was the day that he died. So, um, and so I remained in Gainesville, but his death at age 33, we were both 33, was such a shock um, because, um, you know, everybody thought I was a widow um, from Vietnam. They thought my husband died in the Vietnam. And I said, no, he had a, massive heart attack. And so, you know, you're only treated with the medicine that you have, the health care you have at the time something happens. That if he had had that heart attack now, he wouldn't die. Um, he had what's called a myocardial infarction, infection or something like that. And it was massive. And I just could not believe he was dead. I stayed on in Gainesville and I remember, um, uh, there was this book that he, he used to love to read. He read all the time. And there was this book he read and wanted me to read. And so I was mad at him because he didn't help me more around the, around the house with the kids and all. So I wouldn't read whatever he wanted me to read. So after he died, I said, let me see what this book is. He was so hot on that he wanted me to read. And it was Betty Friedan, The Feminine Mystique. And so I read that book 
And it just really changed my whole head around about things. And I got involved with um, consciousness raising, as you know, Gainesville was the place of the second wave of feminism. And um, so there were many women who had formed consciousness raising groups. And um, just as a small digression, this year, um, we were gonna celebrate and all come together, all of us who were there during that time. And I was gonna be the featured speaker and all of that. I guess you all know about that. And we had to cancel. I mean, they had been planning it for two years. And I was really looking forward to it because we are older now. I'm 82 and everybody is within my age range around five or 10 years. And we were just excited about the idea of being together all together once again, but that didn't happen. But anyway, so I got involved in consciousness raising and um, I was working at Shan's teaching hospital in um, the unit that um, for autistic kids in, in um, the child psychiatry. And it was headed up by Dr. Paul Adams, who was a Quaker, who was just very progressive. And he, um, he just had such a big influence on our lives because he lived far into the future and we were doing Eastern religion and we were omen and meditating and doing all kinds of things. And so he asked me to uh, ask me and this uh, other woman, Judy Levy, to do a didactic seminar on um, um, what was happening with women's reproductive health. And the climate at that time is that abortion was still illegal, was illegal and women were dying all over the country from self-induced abortions. And so, um, and, and women started organizing around that. And um, so Judy Levy and I gave this um, um, talk, the seminar, and then afterwards, the two of us, or three of us over in Shands became the places that women would come to if they needed an abortion. So in the beginning, we didn't know anywhere for them to get an abortion. But, you know, people come and ask you, then you try to find out. And so we found out about the um, a doctor in Jacksonville, Max Suter who um, would perform abortion and we started, and we also found out about clergy consultation, which was a group of Catholic priests in New York City working out of Judson Memorial Church who would um, help women if they wanted to come get abortion. So you give them the phone number, they will call that number, they will go to New York City and then the priests would help get them over to the what was then called the Women's Center, which was an abortion clinic in New York. So that worked for all, you know, for a lot of the women who came to us. But then a black woman came and asked, and so we were giving her the phone number and all that. She says, well, I don't need a phone number. I don't know anybody in New York. I don't have any way to get there. And, you know, she didn't have money for the abortion either. And so about a month or so or two months or so later, she died from a self-induced abortion. And we just really kind of started to thinking about organizing around this as other women were organizing sort of underground around abortion. And me, uh, Judy Levy and Margaret Parrish, we would all meet at Judy's house and sit around in the dining room, um, I mean, in the kitchen around her table and strategize. So in, um, uh, right after Roe v. Wade in 1974, we opened up um, the Gaysville Women's Health Center, which was the first trimester abortion clinic. And it was uh, right across the street, um, I think 805 Southwest 4th Avenue, right across the street from Alachua General Hospital. And um, we didn't ask the medical community for permission because they knew, we knew they would say no because Planned Parenthood had asked them for permission several years. Is this what you want to hear? Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, years. Huh? But while you're talking, we'll be muted. Just, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, for several years, 
to open an abortion clinic and the medical society said no. So we just opened it and they read about it in the newspaper just like everybody else. But we used that center to look at how services should be delivered to women around women's health care, uh, gynecological wellness. And um, we, we developed it really out of how we wanted to be treated as women. What did we want to know? How would we want to be treated? So we performed first trimester abortions and well woman GYN care. And the thing I noticed there is it applies to African-American women, even though we were like, what, what 10 or 20% of the population in Gainesville, we were 50% getting abortions. And that was also was uh, surprising to me is that the women were not necessarily coming in alone and scared and all. You know, the men would come with them, their partners came with them. And it was sort of, it was, it was kind of unbelievable because we often thought about, heard only about the women who, um, who came to us and they necessarily may or may not have had their um, partner's support. Um, so we, uh, the center was really a haven, a really wonderful place. And we sort of set the bar around demedicalizing health facilities that back then all the health facilities had sort of white walls, um, gray asphalt tile floors, and just looked very boring and very drab. We put in shag carpet and low slung um, rugs and uh, in the exam rooms, you know, we had flowers and plants and we had posters on the wall and we just made it real like more homey and more inviting. Um, the Well Woman GYN Clinic was really our educational place. Um, we had residents from the um, University of Florida come and uh, work with us and we had to teach them how to work with women, how to be gentle, uh, how to heat up the metal speculum so that it's not icy cold going inside your vagina, um, how to do pelvic exams, how to talk to women, how not to come in when the woman is naked and introduce yourself as Dr. So-and-so, but they would come in when you were fully clothed and introduce themselves, they put the gown on, then they would come back in. Uh, it was really teaching and then teaching women about their bodies. What is the clitoris? What is its function? How, we, how, how do we look? What does our, what, what does our cervix look like? Um, all of the things that we needed to know about our bodies, even as basic as it's really okay to touch yourself with your hands. It, it's really fine. You need to know what your body looks like when it's healthy so that you can know what it looks like when something is happening, when it becomes unhealthy. Um, what we noticed there in terms of population is the African-American women weren't coming so much. Our biggest population was the students from the U of F because they didn't want to go to the student center. And they found that our place very inviting and they were basically white women. So I found that disturbing to me because I know that um, how do we get, how do I get black women to um, come forth and what was the work that needed to be done? Well, it'll be a, a, a few years from now before I will get the answer to that. In 1978, Judy, Margaret, and I opened up Birthplace, which was an alternative birthing center. Because while we were at the Gainesville Women's Health Center, a lot of white women had started to having their babies at home. And um, they would need a doctor to check their babies um, because they'd been delivered by a midwife and they would bring them to our clinic and our doctors would check them. And so that's when we learned that, oh, wow, women want to participate in their birth. They want to participate in their pregnancy. They want to know what's happening. So in so 1978, I think it was November 78, we opened up um, Birthplace, which is over on um, Second Avenue um, um, a big old, um, meth, um, parsonage that was there, wonderful stately, um, two-story house. Um, I know it's still there. Uh, it was just, um, it was just wonderful. And to tell you the truth, um, the experiences at both of these centers 
have been really still very crowning events in my life. And um, uh, we had um, uh, births and a birth with the nurse midwife, um, Nancy Redfern. And um, I think I witnessed close to 100 births there. And I learned so much about how we should be treated when we're pregnant. And um, we had uh, wonderful intake procedures and the women would come in in the morning and they would say, I woke up this morning, I was so excited because this was my day to go to birthplace. And it was just, a, it was a big old house that we, you know, had antique furniture in. I had a good time buying antique furniture and decorating it. And we had a kitchen, we cook and women would come in, you know, they, we might have some bed, bread break, baking and they can come in and have coffee and they would go upstairs and weigh themselves and, and all and then talk with the midwife for at least one hour. And uh, at the time of birth, the whole family moved in. And so um, the men were active participants in the birth. They often caught the babies. Um, they would cut the cords. They would weigh the babies. And, uh, you know, nobody fainted. And um, there were just a lot of incredible things that happened. Like so many babies were born on their father's birthday, which was incredible. And, um, you know, children would be there to watch the birth. And the mothers actually would stay with us. The average person would stay up three to four hours after birth and then go home. Um, we only, we charged $1,300 for the services, which had to be paid cash. And again, I noticed that black women were unable to do it because most didn't have money. And also the whole consciousness of the importance of home birth had not um, kind of gotten through to the community. And so, um, but we did have several um, black births. Um, and so I left the Birkin Center and started to work at Santa Fe Community College, mostly because we needed another midwife and not another talking type person like me. I was just a birth attendant. Um, and it was there at Santa Fe Community College, I headed up a program. Um, they used to have something called CETA, which was a comprehensive education training program. And they would uh, work with young people who had been kicked out, you know, I feel like they were pushed out of school. Um, but these were young women and men who had families and had children. And um, I noticed the women would miss so much school and they were being paid minimum wage to come to school. And I thought, wow, nobody ever paid me to come to school and started talking to them about why were they missing so much school. And that's when I became in touch with the um, pervasive issues of black women's health. A lot of them were young, they were hypertensive, they had diabetes, they had um, all kinds of diseases that I didn't think that we got until we were much older. And then, so they would use up their sick days on themselves and on their children. And so it, that was the reason for it. And so it, I started looking into black women's health issues. What were they? What was the difference? And that's how I started my journey in Black Women's Health. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, uh, I am so grateful that you came through Gainesville and that you accomplished so much um, and that you were a part of that second wave um, in Gainesville because it is so important. Um, and to know that that all happened here um, mm -hmm. is very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we wanted to talk um, a little bit more about uh, general healthcare disparities um, that um, the National Black uh, Women's Health Imperative um, mm -hmm. have worked on. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit how that imperative got started? Okay, it was called the National Black Women's Health Project. And then the name got changed somewhere in the 90s. I don't know. I still don't know why we changed it. But anyway, the board voted to change it. I don't know why we changed it. It was a good name, I thought, because I named it probably. But anyway, but we started out 
um, the same way that I started out with um, consciousness raising. And we called our self-help groups because the way racism has affected us. If we said consciousness raising, black women said, oh, that's a white woman thing. That's not our thing. So we just took the same process and gave it another name. Um, we called it um, forming self-help groups. And the first thing we did was we had the first national conference on black women's health issues at um, in, in Atlanta at Spelman College. Well, I tried to do this Black Women's Part in Gainesville. When I first got the idea, I invited a lot of Black women to come to let's sit and talk about health. And this could have started in Gainesville, but I could not get the cohort of Black women that I needed to sit with me. The first time I called a meeting, only one person came. And I was so upset, I called my mother. And my mother said, well, how many people came last year? I said, I didn't have anything last year. She said, and so you had nobody come. I said, right. She said, well, you had one person come. So you got 100%. And, you know, so she just kind of helped me change my head around. And I then the Black women there, it wasn't that they didn't like me. They didn't understand me. They didn't understand what I was talking about, that I was a lesbian. I, I was running around with these white women. Um, they just couldn't figure me out. And um, so it wasn't, um, I've come over the years to understand it wasn't personal at all. It's just that they couldn't wrap their head around what we were talking about because it was such a different way of being um, for Black people to talk about it. Just having had the privilege to be able to step outside of yourself and look at how to be in the world in a different way. And so um, I moved to Atlanta simply because I needed to be around Black women who could get into this, who could work with us, who we could talk about it, and it could happen. And it did. Um, first meeting I had, the house was overflowed with people. And, um, and then we started. We convened the first conference in June of 1983 at Spelman College. We thought we'd have two to 300 people come. We had over 2,000 from all over the United States and some women from Canada. So, and when we came out of that, we started forming these self-help groups, which were really consciousness raising groups where women would get together and tell the story of their lives. And I hope that you young women, I'm just speaking to you now, will adopt this as a way of organizing. It's the most powerful thing you can do because everybody has a story. And the, the, the important part about using this process of talking out loud in the presence of others, it works to, um, it works first for the person because you get to verbalize it. And a lot of us, I mean, I don't know if the two of you even know each other's stories, you know. You get to know what it's been like for you growing up. And you can just take that one topic and you can use it for years. Because every time you talk about it, you'll talk about some different aspect of your life. For the people who are listening, it's also, uh, for the people who are talking, it's healing. For the people who are listening, it's also healing, but it also helps you think about similar things or it reminds you of something or there's a thread in there that's you. So you kind of get this two-way kind of consciousness raising that helps you to understand things. And so it encourages you also to break the conspiracy of silence, which is something that you know, uh, the fact that my husband beat me is my business. I don't want to tell anybody. And then you find out that 20 other women in the, in, in the uh, room have all had similar things happen to them. Or you talk about I was raped and uh, all the sexual abuse. And then as a group, you then get to understand what your issues are. So we came out of our self-help groups understanding that a lot of us have been victims of violence, uh, sexual abuse, 
was rampant. Um, incest, rape, all of this was rampant. Um, we found out that a lot of us had physical health issues, um, diabetes, um, cancer, uh, all of the all of those chronic diseases. But what was on top was what was these other issues that we hadn't dealt with these kind of social issues. Uh, and until you can get rid of that, you can't work on the other because the way the, way the um, discrimination, racism, sexism, homophobic, classism, all of these issues and violence and uh, just the general oppression of women, it robs you of your self-esteem. It makes you feel like you're not worth a damn. And so why should I do anything? And then in turn, we don't love ourselves. We don't love ourselves enough to be able to take the next step. And I see that same thing happening among young women and it pains me because there's a way that you can get out of this, that you can claim your power, that you can know who you are, and then you can be in charge of your life, working on your high blood pressure, your diabetes, and all of that stuff. But as long as you got this weight on your shoulder, this oppressive foot, we can't move. And so I say, if you want to organize, pull women together like you've never done before, just tell your stories. And it's all confidential. We don't talk about you know, well, this is what happened to this person. This is what happened to Billy. It ain't about Billy. It's about the institution of racism and homophobia and all, and how these, um, all of these isms work to oppress women. And that's what we have to lift first, oppression, and then we can move on. Um, I would say that was the greatest accomplishment of Black Women's Health Project. There are women now who have taken this model of organizing and they use it with everybody. They use it in their workplace. They use it with their family members. They use it. It's just been so wonderful because it helps you see the world in a real different kind of way. Um, of course, we had all the other kind of programs where you educate people and everything. But the big thing was helping people to understand um, internalized oppression and how to unhook from it. That is our greatest enemy. Thank you, Ms. Avery. So take a, a sip of water. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're in the middle of a pandemic and mm -hmm. um, something that isn't being talked about enough is how disproportionately uh, people of color are dying and being drastically affected by um, by the virus uh, for so many different reasons. Um, right. People of color are more likely to have pre-existing health conditions. They're less likely to be insured. They're more likely to work service jobs where we have to be in constant contact with people. Um, and, you know, if they are, they are exhibiting symptoms of the virus. They're less likely to be recommended by a doctor to cat, get tested. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you wear a mask, um, you may get profiled. Um, right. And there's the fear of being seen as a criminal. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, what are some of the things or do you know of that um, the Black Women's Health Imperative are doing to address um, the disparities that right. are kind of being exacerbated by the pandemic? Well, the one thing that they're doing, if you go on the website, you see that our um, in, uh, um, CEO, Linda Blunt, is on constant, she's an epidemiologist too, so she's on constant town meetings and Instagram things and all of these educating the public and talking directly to Black people because the way racism has affected us we hear about something happening, you know, and people think, okay, well, that just happened to the folks in China. It ain't going to happen to black people in Albany, Georgia. Or you get on TV, everybody you see is white, and you said, okay, there's something white people have. Black people ain't going to get it. Uh, and then we also 
people in the black community quite often live in a whole different world. I'm sure it's the same thing for Latinas and other people of color. I have my Asian friends who talk about now when they go out with a mask, they also put on shades so that people can't see their eyes and say horrible things to them because they're Asian and calling it the China. Um, China virus and all that kind of thing. So there are so many ways that um, we as a people have learned how to discriminate and hurt other people. So a lot of us, in order to save ourselves, we seal ourselves off from that as much as possible. Because uh, my daughter lives in Jacksonville. And when when we first started hearing about the virus up here, you know, I started talking to her and I said, you know, you need to start taking precautions. She says, why? I said, well, because this, this, and that. And I said, uh, I'm, you know, wearing masks and gloves and all of that. They didn't even have, um, uh, well, at first, before we started wearing any masks and gloves, I was telling her to go to the grocery store. I said, they're gonna run out of toilet paper. They're gonna run out of gloves. They're gonna run out of masks. They're gonna run out of disinfectant wipes. So she came back home, she says, mama, we got plenty of toilet paper. There's no problem, you know, da 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 I said, did you buy some? Oh, yeah, I bought some. And she said, black people over here don't go nowhere. It ain't going to much hit our community because these people don't got no passports and they ain't been traveling to Rome and all these other places where the virus is coming from because they don't go much out of Duval County. And so, you know, later it's true. But that's the thinking. And so I had to say, hey, baby, no, this is what's happening. And um, and so uh, uh, so we don't live in that world. We do not live in the white world. And not a lot of people don't. But those of us who, who know we have to live in both worlds, we do it. But a lot of Black people do not live in the white world. So there were no messages directly to us um, about um, COVID-19. Um, take the case of the, um, in Albany, Georgia where they had this funeral for the janitor and all of those people went to the funeral. And that was right when I think 30 some of them died from being at the funeral. And one of my friends wrote to me and said, I was at a funeral on Saturday and I heard about some people were getting the virus and I went home and um, quarantined myself. I didn't think much about it. She said, and Janice Blaylock did the same thing. I didn't think much about it. And then when the article came out in the New York Times, I thought, whoa, this was the funeral that she was talking about. And so we live in different worlds and we have to have different messages. And so the messages didn't get to black people until it was too late, that we need to be isolating, that we need to be doing these things. And um, <clears throat> that's one of the reasons. The second reason is that we have a very fragmented messed up healthcare system. Healthcare, we don't have a healthcare system. We have healthcare markets when we need a system, a system that understands that my health depends on yours and yours depends on mine. And it's about all of us having access to healthcare and, and, and good care and comprehensive care that's not used as a political weapon with us. And so, you know, um, we went to Cuba three or four years ago, and I was amazed that almost on every three or four blocks, there was a health center. It was, I mean, the numbers of health centers, I stopped counting them. It was so many as we rode around in the buses. It was just so many. And so <coughs> we know how to do health care. We just don't do it for all of our people, and we measure it by the wrong end of the stick. It doesn't matter how good you say your, um, your medicine is, your procedures are. If I need it and I can't get it, you don't have it. So we need to be measuring it by how many people have access. And a lot of people don't have access. So that's an issue. Then within the healthcare system, we have horrible racial bias, which you um, alluded to. And, um, you know, I was telling someone the other day, they said, I said, I stay in the house because I'm 82 years old. I'm a black woman and they are not going to give me a ventilator. You know, you already live a, a whole life. I would give it to someone who's 28 rather than giving it to you. So I said, I'm keeping my butt home so that they don't have to be faced to make that decision. But um, there is 
bias, and that would be age. And um, uh, um, but I'm just saying, some of us have multiple intersectionalities that make it so that we are not um, we are not considered important. Which brings up another point you mentioned is that the fifteen sixteen dollar hour people are the ones who are holding this thing together. They're the ones working in the shopping, in the grocery stores, stocking the shelves, uh, behind the counter, selling meat in the deli. How much you think them people make? You know, they're the aides and the orderlies, the people who clean the floors in the hospitals at night where COVID is. Nobody thinks about them. The people who pick up our garbage, you know, these are the quote unquote heroes they're the ones that's keeping, making it so that we can stay home. You know, we are the privileged ones, the ones who can stay home, the ones who got enough money to go buy groceries when we don't have an income. You see, and so it's just a very crazy, um, non-people caring kind of system, haphazard system. So that when you get something like this pandemic, all of the stuff starts to, fall apart. The testing sites, are they, uh, have you heard of any sites in the hood? You know, are there any testing sites and the people from the hood, can they even get tested? Privileged people are having trouble getting tested. So you know it's not happening for people of color. By the way, we, we went to a big conference in, um, in November in Nairobi and we learned a new term that we need to stop calling ourselves people of color and start calling ourselves people of the global majority. I mean, just think about that. And if you don't want that, if you say, well, are we really the majority? Think of China. And you say, oh yeah, we're the majority. You say, well, oh yeah, oh yeah. You can even put that, China will just put it right over the top. But if we would band together as people of the global majority, which is what the people who call themselves the majority, that's what they fear. That's what they fear the most, that we're, as my wife always says, they think we're going to treat them the way they treat us. And that is exactly what drives a lot. So we have that. We have, um, uh, mm, let me see, I talk about different words, our testing sites. Um, oh, and we think about, the incarcerated and the homeless. You think about how many black and brown people are locked up in jails and um, um, it's just awful. And you're talking about social distancing. Oh yeah, really? <laughs> Is that a possibility? And you talk about weaponizing healthcare. Like, you know, what keeps guards and all from not doing social distancing? They don't wanna wear a mask and gloves, they don't care if they give it to them. And then we had homelessness that is rampant. Um, back in the day when I grew up, there was maybe one or two bums. And these were men who hopped on trains and rode all over the place. And they were kind of called hobos <clears throat> and bums. Now we have unbelievable homelessness. I heard that LA has, <clears throat> 36,000 homeless people. That's a whole city of people. And here in Massachusetts, um, one of the things um, that, 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 that the governor here has done, who by the way is a Republican governor, who is an excellent governor. Um, we have, I think 99% of people in the state of Massachusetts have healthcare coverage for everything. But they they opened up a whole um, the Bay Expo in in um, Boston strictly for the homeless population, where they could come and they could be if they test positive, they could go there. That meant they had shelter. There was staff with nurses and all, and kept people got them off the streets you know, and treating them and realizing that homelessness is also um, an issue. And, um, and, you know, so what can I say? All of the big cities that have large black populations, 
They also have high incidence of people with COVID and people dying. And then there's the shame that people feel within the black community. I have a friend in Georgetown, South Carolina, who her best friend is a um, the funeral director. And she's saying people will don't want to tell her what they died of. She asked her, did they die from the virus? And they say they don't want to tell. Them. She said, well, I'm not picking the body up. You know, so there's a lot of shame and all. And think about funeral directors who are overwhelmed and um, they don't have room for this. You know, New York City usually has 30 deaths a day and they got like a thousand, you know, so people are in refrigerated trucks and it's, it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. And um, we got absolutely the a leader now that most of us don't believe in, um, who acts like a king, and who um, who can be at odds with science and medicine and all. And so it's just a very kind of sad time for us. And my sadness goes out to your generation. You all are young people who are getting ready to enter into the world. And I'm saying to you, don't be disheartened. Come full force and change this thing around. You all have the ability to change it. You got the longevity, you got your full lives in front of you and you can make changes. And goodness knows we need you to take over and take charge because some of us are tired. Some of us uh, have no knowledge, but you have the energy and you all are smart. You all are brilliant. And um, just and knowing that you don't have to take all of this, that we can have a better world. And so I'm dependent on you. I'm dependent on you. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Avery. Um, I had another question. When you were speaking about people of color and white people living in completely different worlds and mm -hmm. having a difficulty reaching into the black communities and having these messages sent out to make sure that everybody has the knowledge that they need. How do you think that we can bridge the gap between those two worlds or multiple worlds that people in different communities live in in order to improve that? Well, they are bridge makers. There are people who are bridges and they will be your activists who will speak eloquently to both communities. But um, sort of, I think we in the African American community, those health people, we also have to take some responsibility to not being better about getting our messages out to our people. I mean, the pandemic has taught us a lesson. It will never catch any of us like this again. I think we were all kind of like, you know, like a deal with our, my, you know, and the head, eyes and caught in the head, like, we, you know, you couldn't have told me. When I talked to Pam Smith on March the 12th and said, I'm not coming to Gainesville because Dr. Fauci said age and all of that, I shouldn't travel. I had no idea that was on the, that was on like the 10th of March or something. Uh, I had no idea on March 14th that I would be staying in my house for two solid weeks. We didn't foresee what was coming. We won't get caught like that again. If something like that happened, all because I know a lot of Latino activists and um, a, a, a lot of Asian activists. Honey, we will be on this thing like white on rice the next time to make sure we get these messages to our community. And for us in the black community, don't stop listening to stupid preachers who know absolutely nothing. And you know, um, the evangelicals who who think God is protecting them. See, so we got these kind of things we have to address, but we can do that. And so I think that we all got caught off guard. Um, bridging the community, each person got to figure out where they want to be in this whole thing and how they want to be. Uh, but there will always be us bridge people who will have, I consider myself a bridge person, one foot in one world and one foot in the other. And, um, but a lot of people are still very distrusting and they have no reason to trust. I mean, for those of us who, who have an education and you can get a job and you're making pretty good money and none of that, but just think about those people who still making 
12, 13, 14 dollars an hour working to a job, they now why should they be trusting? Their lives are hell. You know what I'm saying? And so that's the hard population, but we can talk to them. That might be the best we could get. I don't know if we'll ever be an integrated society. You know, I think there'll still be a lot of parallel playing. But then, you know, if it's a salad, I want to know a tomato is a tomato. I want to know a cucumber is a tomato. I don't want it all smooshed up and ground up and then I can't recognize it. You know what I'm saying? So we need to figure out how we can be together but still be ourselves and who we are. Um, I wanted to ask if you knew anything about the COVID racial tracker that Ibram Kendi is working on. Um, I just know about what I've read. He's the guy with the Justice Social Justice Center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I just know what I've read, which is probably the same thing you've read. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad they're doing it. We don't have a CDC that is into doing it. But in the state of Massachusetts, um, yesterday, the um, the governor gave a total breakdown of all of the races, the numbers of deaths, the numbers of so-and-so, you know? So this kind of goes between liberals and conservatives um, who will do it. But I'm glad that they're, um, I'm glad that they're doing the tracking. Mm -hmm. um, that was the article I think was in the New Republic or something like that. And it's too bad our government's not doing that. They need to be doing that. But you know, come November, let's hope we'll have uh, people in office who will be doing these things for us. There was also, um, oh gosh, there was something else that I wanted to talk to you about how um, abortion clinics across the country are not being recognized oh, yeah. as essential services. Right, it's not essential. They, they want any reason to stop women from having abortion because they're trying to build up the white race. And so, you know, they don't care nothing about people's lives they don't care anything about the child they don't care anything about it as long as um you know once they're alive i wish somebody would bring a class action suit against some of these people and get like two or three million dollars of what it costs to raise a child yeah. you know nobody looks at the lives of women is they have shifted that conversation to the fetus and made it uh of walking around, making decisions, taking care of themselves, kind of full person, which they are not. Mm -hmm. So that's no surprise. Um, but you know, women have to understand um, plan C and how to get, um, do medical abortions, um, you know, um, might have to revert back to underground sources for abortions, safe abortions. Um, we have to be ready. And I tell black women all the time, you can keep your eye, your head in the sand because you don't want to talk about abortion, but you got to at least look into what plan C is and have a plan. I, um, I, back to, back to the seventies, I was talking to one of my, um, white girlfriends and I said, tell me, how did you all cope in the seventies? They say, well, we had a group of about 10 of us and everybody had to save up a thousand dollars. And that's a lot of money for them. I said, a thousand dollars. She said, well, we saved as much as we could. If someone in the group got pregnant, we gave her all of the money and she could go and get an abortion. And I'm thinking, whoa, you know, and I thought of that. So you got to think about how we're going to survive. This is what it's about. Um, but um, I'll tell you, at the conference I went to in Nairobi, the largest attended workshop was how do we maintain safe abortion in the world it was overflowing. I couldn't even get in the room. I was like three deep outside. And so if you look at it as the issue of the world and uh, educate women to get on board with plan C so that a medical, I mean, a, um, <clears throat> so that we don't have to have um, uh, surgical abortions anymore that we would then be able to take pills and, and, and do it. That's what we're gonna to have to revert to. Because as Gloria Steinem says, she said something the other day that I thought was real interesting. She said, population control left in the hands of women, we get it right. We keep the balance of male, female, but it's when the outsiders come in, like China did, you get too many boys, 
You know, you get there's too many of this, but if left in the hands of women, somehow it's something inside of us that comes along that lets you know this one will not be. You know, and it doesn't mean all of them, but this one should not be. So it's interesting. Um, I know some people who may be listening um, may be new to the concept of like what you were saying about how it's a way of um, increasing the white race. Um, Mm -hmm. Can you dive into that and kind of explain that? Well, if you look at the way um, the white supremacy that's going on now, the white racism, um, the backlash, and all among Christian evangelicals and all the push to stop safe abortions um, and young women. And I've heard, I've read many accounts that young women, young white women are told to have babies, start having babies. They don't want to become the majority. I mean, the minority. And just think um, many years ago came out about the colorization of America how so many people of color were coming in. So that's that's affecting the immigration. Why do you think they're trying to send the dreamers away? Why do you think they're trying to stop people at the border? Why do you think they're trying to do all these things? Um, because they, and they're people of color. The white Europeans and all, they're not getting all stopped and iced out of here and everything, but they're people of color who are being iced out, you know? And um, they don't want the colorization of America. But we are the global majority. Right. But as far as like how that relates to abortion. Oh, well, making it inaccessible, then white women can't get it. Making it illegal starts to get a headset against it. Um, Making it illegal makes you wrong. You become something to be shunned because it, it just turns the whole head around about it instead of it being a woman's right to choose. You don't have the right to choose. And it's not that they care about the children. So all they want is for white women to not have access to abortion. But they're stupid because more women of color, more African-American, the highest group of people having abortions. So that means you're going to get a whole lot of black people and a whole lot of people of color because the abortion have been banned. So you see, it's not logical thinking yeah. at all. And uh, it's funny because we're, our generation, we're having the least amount of kids of generations of the past. Right. And the GOP hates that yeah, of um, course. to the point mm-hmm. where they've been really trying to make a point of trying to get young people to start families and, and, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. get to thinking about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, um, I know. Miss Avery, um, are there any other things that you think would be important to add to this archive um, regarding? I would just like to say, as I have a great appreciation for this archive, the um, Proctor Archives, um, they gave me a wonderful gift. Um, I guess about five or six years ago, my son, who has the same name as his father, got us, uh, he was doing something, fooling around with Gmail or something, and he found a transcript. Um, he says, mom, they must be talking about daddy when daddy was at the University of Florida. And so we looked at it and lo and behold, someone had transcribed an interview that was done with Wesley Sr. in the 70s, in the early 70s. So I was able to make contacts at Proctor and I finally got to the woman who found the tapes from the 70s, who then got them downloaded and put into a form that my children could hear their father's voice. And that is just one of the best presents that we could ever have. And so I appreciate you. I'm glad you're doing this. It's wonderful. And I'm glad it's oral because I like to talk. <laughs> well, I think that was probably Deborah Hendricks who Yeah, just, it was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's she's 
does all of the digitizing for our pro yeah. project and she'll probably hear that and she'll probably be very happy to hear. Oh my God, she was wonderful. I can remember the morning I got the email when she told me, she said, I got the tapes or well, they're old and I don't know if I can transcribe them. And I remember when I got the email from her, I think it said good news or something like that. And I opened it up and she did it. And then I came and I met her. I told her, I said, the next time I come to Gainesville, I want to take you to lunch and everything. So I met her and I was going to get in touch with her to make sure we connected when I came down in March, you know. But um, I'll be back. I have my, my son, my grandson, and my daughter-in-law all live there. Angela works in the Department of Surgery um, and Wesley drives truck for, U um, for UPS. He's one of those people out there, you know, being a hero. And um, grandson goes to the University of South Florida. Yeah. Well, what's in Tampa? Central Florida? Central. He goes to Central Florida. Yeah, he's an engineering first-year student, you know, at home, pissed off with his parents because he can't go out and play wiffle ball. You know, it's just like having a hard time. I feel bad for the teenagers, you know, the young people. We want to get out. We old people, I'm fine sitting in the house. <laughs> I don't want to go nowhere. My wife doesn't want to go anywhere anyway. So she was so glad to hear we didn't have to go anywhere. And she said, oh God, I don't take my gown off. No, you don't. <laughs> but anyway, so that's it. <laughs> I really wish you were able to come in March and I hope that we do get to have you come over to the university when all of this is over. Um, yeah. But thank well, you. Well, they so said they're going to try to bring me down in um, in the fall. I don't know. Yes. Or whenever. But the yeah. women's studies department, they won't, they will, they'll, they'll make it happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, we want to talk to you a little bit. Uh, for a second after this recording, but um, I think okay. we can stop the interview now. But thank you okay. so much, Miss Avery. We really You're appreciate welcome. it. It was incredible. My pleasure.